ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I think we'll kick off and I think there's going to be people that are going to join us throughout the next 55, 60 minutes. So hopefully as they do, they will pick up what we're putting down, hopefully. So for those of you for joining us for the first time, welcome. My name's Paul Jantz and you're going to be in for a bit of a treat. Um, thanks to our major supporters and our professional partners. Education is the key, providing all sorts of different educational platforms to you guys and our training and our education is paramount in doing that. Our supporters, we've got Hall Chadwick, we've got Profit Master, we've got I Keep Corporate Lifeline and Lloyd's Auctioneers and Valuers. So I mentioned this before in terms of what professional partners education is all about, and it's about providing a platform for greater learning, greater education, um, so that each and every one of you can be successful in whatever you wish that to be, uh, whether that is through our live shows, these sorts of shows, um, our masterclass, our our Women in Accounting we had two weeks ago, we've got another one coming up on May 26, or whether it's our podcast series that I mentioned as well, that we're about to start pushing out a lot of different podcast content as well. So please keep an eye for that. This series is all about just something I worked on last year again, um, about how I can bring different layers of CEOs to the forefront and how as leaders, you know, not all leaders need to be CEOs, um, how you as a leader can look to improve your own leadership qualities and however that means that the content that you're going to hear and take away from hopefully there are one two three four ten different things that you can work on you know I've, I've led companies I've also been led and you know it doesn't you, you don't like I said before you don't need to be a CEO to be a good leader it's all about mindset that mindset to growth that mindset to how do I continually grow internally to become a better person and a better leader for my people as well so Hopefully all of you will be online for the next 45, 50 minutes and you can take away a lot from that. Um, we do have at the bottom there, we have a chat bar, we have a q and I'll be moderating both. So as we work through this, if you've got any questions and want to talk to us, please let us know. It'd be great to hear from you. Let me get to my guest. So he's a leader that probably doesn't do too many of these and might've done these a little bit during the pandemic, but it's, it's great to have him here and just to see some of the comments that we've seen online with regards to you know it's great that you've got guys so let me introduce the founder and chief executive of ignition formerly practice ignition guy pearson welcome to the show how are you good paul thanks thanks for having me everybody it's great to be here yeah it's mate it's my pleasure it's um i think we connected last year over a few things and it's it's funny enough to think that we're now sort of getting back to a little bit of normality which has been fantastic to see yeah, it's nice to be back. I went to my first in-person event last week just for a walk around the trade show floor. And uh, that was kind of nice just to see some old faces. Um, yeah. not that they were old, just people I hadn't seen in a couple of years. <laughs> and you're right, though, because it's like I know it's been it's almost like the, the January sort of award season. It's been conference season the last three or four weeks with all the different conferences on. But And I was at one also probably about oh, maybe six weeks ago, seven weeks ago now. It is weird to be back in that type of situation when you haven't seen people for quite a while but it is good yeah no 100 percent um anyway i'm looking forward to doing a bit more um i get to go to a few overseas conferences coming up so if anyone is dialing from overseas hopefully i'll see you there yeah brilliant brilliant all right let's start with um there was a there was a good announcement and we can see with your background there women in accounting supported by ignition so congratulations i know the team have done an awesome job to get that out the top 50 women in accounting it was released last week um you'd be pretty proud of what you're doing and how you continue to do this i know we'll go into this a little bit more detail later on but how do you feel about obviously just another announcement another year that was great um this process was the first one i wasn't involved in um uh sort of having helped kind of get it off the ground um and you know we, we'll talk about later i think why 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 it exists but um just mm -hmm. awesome to see a lot more diversity, uh, huge range of new winners and a huge number of submissions from around the world. And um, yeah, just great to you know, once again be a part of it. And I must admit the website, even since the new launch, like the announcement page, the design elements, like what you see behind me, like everything was just sort of that next level above, um, which is great and awesome and a huge buzz around our, our team, but also in the community. So I'm um, yeah, hugely proud to be associated with it. Yeah, brilliant. And when it's a global initiative as well, how many, how many countries totally represented? I do not know. Brooke will have the answer to that, yeah. but it's north north of north of twenty. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite a substantial 
number of um, of countries. Um, and obviously, we only we only push you know media or, or requests you know through other networks, LinkedIn and other things. So you know, I'm not sure how we get the rest of the 300 odd countries around the world to, <laughs> to to get nominees and what languages need to post them. But we're we're pretty stoked with the um. Yeah, the, you're the on uplift. the line. You're yeah. on the way, and that's that's the key thing, and that's the great thing about the from a from a global initiative point of view that um, it's awesome that it can be recognised with so many ways. And we yeah we will get into that later on. Good to see for everyone also joining us. We're, we're, we're colour coded. We text each other this morning and make sure that we're wearing the right. Uh, what did Brooks say? We, she called it pink. We, you sort of mentioned it was more of a salmon colour. But <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say you're in light salmon. I'm in deep, deep <laughs> salmon, but neither of us, I feel, are colour experts. So feel free to judge. <laughs> exactly. And Mate, tell us a little bit about you. Let's start off with you. For people that don't know a lot about you, um, tell us a little bit about you, the person. Uh, what drives you as an individual? What drives me? Um, so I have sort of like an underlying thesis for my existence and it's sort of the greatest good for the greatest number. So my, yeah, like all good accountants, I have a trust, which kind of super funds and stuff, but that holds assets. And so yeah, that's utilism, which kind of is short for the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, ironically, it ties in with the whole purpose of accounting. What do you do with your last dollar and how do you get the most efficiency or most effective return of spending a dollar? Um, and analysis around that. So for me, it's sort of all around that and I like trying to solve bigger problems. So um, I'm less likely to volunteer to do one thing for an individual and more likely to try and figure out how to solve the underlying problem. Now, there's no right or wrong on that. It's just, I'm kind of wired that way. And I really like the idea of doing everything as a team. I grew up playing team sports. Um, I like you know bands. I don't really like solo artists. You know, like my whole thing is around doing things together. So those two things kind of in line very much probably drive me towards you know trying to do things with people to achieve great outcomes and solve big problems. That's a mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I probably haven't answered that question that way before, so it's a little bit of a, a new one for me and sort of letting it settle in. Yeah, good. No, I, I like that actually. It's 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 quite and it's a, it's interesting one. Because as you're saying that, and even to the people that are watching it, it, it does make you think about your own perspective on that and um, how you can maybe, if you don't have that, how you can find that as well. Because I think not always will we always have things like that, but that's the beauty of these type of sessions as well. It makes you think about, oh, is that something that I should be thinking about myself? Which is brilliant. I, I actually love it. Yeah, brilliant. But um, you, you, you sort of mentioned before with regards to being, being an accountant, I suppose you, you were a, a CA from, from what I've read and you obviously decided to swap the, the cubicle over to the entrepreneurial mindset and uh, grow this company now, you know, from debits and credits to set up practice ignition. Um, uh, tell us about that. Tell us how you got into that or why you left and then why you created what you've created today. Yeah, sure. Um, so I had a history in sort of mid-tier accounting uh, straight out of high school. I won't go into too long a backspill, but sort of worked at two different firms in Sydney. Had a great time at both. Um, decided to leave one to start a cloud accounting firm in 2000. And decision was 2008. I'd finished my CA. was sort of on the path to get tax agents license, et cetera. Um, and went overseas, spent my money like a very bad accountant after the GFC, uh, came back to work to Four Pines as one of the first bartenders at night and kicked off interactive. Um, and that kind of began a period in my life. I was 25 of throw everything against the wall, see what sticks. So like very entrepreneurial. I had time. I didn't have money, didn't have attachments. And so with that came, you know, try a whole bunch of different things. So the accounting firm was first and then it was what tech doesn't exist in our world that I could potentially figure out how to build to solve problems. Um, and so there was a few ventures. I mean, they're probably, I think you talked about failure later. Like for me, they were just learning. So we can dig into those a little bit yeah. deeper later on. Um, and off the back of that, settled on one. So um, I was very, very frustrated that my, unlike my clients at my accounting firm, uh, they all in software and, and uh, e-commerce effectively at you know, early 2011. Why? That they had a source of truth, like a contract between two parties that stipulated what was going to happen and it drove their back-end systems and updated marketing, all those sorts of things. Um, in both instances of those industries, so software and e-commerce, why it didn't exist for the um, uh, services industry. Um, now, we'd launched monthly recurring as sort of a go-to-market for everything that was 
standardized monthly or quarterly um, and annualized, we would just do monthly retainers and then we'd have projects which would be a different kind of pricing mechanism. But um, finding out a way to run that, that was connected to the contract uh, invoicing collections and driving workflows. So no work that was done um, because accountants want to help people. No work that was done didn't have a contract that the clients had signed off on on a variation. So we could always get paid. Um, and I band-aided a bunch of solutions together using the sort of predecessor that Zapier. Um, once again, I had time, no money. So like I was doing all this stuff myself um, and trying not to stuff it up too much. Um, and off the back of that, I realized that it was kind of where I thought the industry would head. Back then you could only, so you know, Zero's only model or the one they recommended as an example was you on sell the subscription to your clients. Yeah. Same with Receipt Bank or Dext and everyone was kind of following suit. So for me, two things were clear. Small businesses don't like surprise bills. Running a monthly business in the accounting lined you up to distribute software and be a part of the subscription and be in the data flow. Uh, and thirdly, it was better for cash flow for everybody. Um, and so all those things kind of aligned, couldn't figure out why there wasn't a solution or um, why certain individual uh, software plays didn't sort of line up together in a better way through APIs. And got very frustrated, was stubborn, once again, had time, not money, uh, but had a little bit of cash lying around to, to kick off um, uh, an MVP. Um, so brought on one little angel investor with me um, and basically set about trying to find some designers and coders to try and build a minimum viable product. So like the very first ugly version you see of anything yeah. um, to get some feedback on whether or not it was just me and I was crazy or if um, people thought that they would want to use this product. Um, that's kind of how it all transpired. And you know, as it turned out, people were keen to use the product. Um, it's fair to say that we probably built the product on a little bit too narrow a spec at the beginning. EG was almost modeled on my accounting firm, which is 90% fixed fee. Yeah. And people were on their transition to that as opposed to that on day one. Um, and so, you know, lots of, lots of early learnings and thankfully managed to get off the ground, finally get some customers a year or so later that were paying and raise some capital. And, you know, I cannot write software. I'm not that talented. I can build you a bad website at the best. Um, of my abilities and so um, you know off and away we went and you know sort of fast forward what are we, nine eight nine years yeah nine year overnight story of some success and here we are there you go so so you, you so the idea was what year uh 2011 was kind of like the back of the beer coaster okay um 2012 i think incorporation date might have even been 20 yeah I was an accountant that owned an accounting firm. Like, <laughs> you know, rule number one, assign the IP to the right entity Did to he, pay all the invoices out of that entity. So you yeah. never have any issues or questions around that when you go through legals and due diligence. So um, 2011 incorporated, which the domain names, that sort of thing. And then 2012 started building the product after designing it. And then we didn't yeah. launch it till the end of 2012 at uh, the second ZeroCon in Australia. Okay. So September, I think. Yeah. And then um, we didn't hire anyone onto the team until early 2013. And at that point, we had someone in Sydney. I was in New Zealand thinking that that would be a big market for us, yeah. working at a Zero's headquarters. Thank you, Rod. I doubt you're watching, but thank you. Um, and then uh, we had one of our developers, an Aussie guy, but he was based in Shanghai, spending some time with his family. So, you know, from day one, we were kind of very much, you know, distributed workforce. And then we all came back to Sydney. Um, sort of later that year and, and ironically it was around about the fun time we had our first customer. So it was a, it was a very momentous year, really. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow, wow. And congrats. Um, so fast forward to today being whatever it is, the 5th of May, hard to believe it's the 5th of May. Um, how, many, how many people you got in the team? How many countries you operating in? 180, give, give or take, um, a few. Um, and we have people in... Someone we had a we had a survey um, when we launched our new brand and and yeah. I wasn't involved in preparing the questions but apparently we have people in twenty six cities, wow. um, which blew my mind. Um, so I think we're only like offices or locations that we would put on our website. There's probably six or eight country. Uh, sorry, ten. There's probably seven countries where I'd say we have team and then we have a few other people kind of dotted around or people who got stuck traveling places in COVID and just decided to stay where they landed oh, yeah. as an example. So, so take, take me through quickly, because it was last year you changed from practice ignition to ignition. 
No, it's about eight weeks ago. I'm glad it feels that long ago for you because it, it means that it feels like it's always been that way. Um, there you go. There you go. There yeah, you go. so it's not, not so distant future. So kudos <laughs> to my marketing team. Did an amazing job. Um, so what yeah, the so really recent. Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of things. So from a pure business and marketing standpoint, uh, Ignition app as a .com as URL is much shorter than practice Ignition. Okay. Just fewer characters. So less, less, less likely to... to make a mistake. Um, our social handles were all Ignition app as well. Um, practice in the name is something that related us to the industry that we served. Uh, Ignition just by itself kind of opens us up to perhaps exploring um, more of that later. And what we're starting to see is accountants and bookkeepers actually getting their clients to use the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and that percentage is growing um, as a like, you know, accountants, you know, this is rewind 24 months we're probably 96 seven percent of our customer base now they're about 90 yeah. percent and that's not not huge numbers it's more just like when you're being pulled in a particular direction unless it's diverting your attention away so most services businesses behind the scenes run almost exactly the same way um and so it just allows us to open up to more broader possibilities in the future and internally allowed us to get a lot crisper because you've got to remember i'm not a designer Mm. And our brand is quite aged. It's kind of like why PricewaterhouseCoopers is PwC, like it allows you to refresh it. Technically, I'm sure the legal entity has the same name. I'm, I'm not sure. I've never received a bill from them. But <laughs> my guess is it's the same. It was a branding exercise, but allowed for sort of a re-identification internally and externally. And that was also part of the, um, the, the focus for us, I think, since the last time we'd all met in person, which was 2019. Yeah. The team had grown 3x. And so it allows for, you know, crisp, sharp messaging internally. And what are we doing for our customers? Crisp, sharp um, and clean externally as well. So less ambiguity. And the website refresh is kind of a sneaking of a better experience for customers as well. So it was like all these things yes. kind of all lined up. Um, and individually, the reason may not be enough, but together it was kind of like uh, we need Makes sense. to get this yeah. done. Yeah. yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, let's talk about you as the CEO of the business. So what are some of your key priorities or deliverables? Um, and probably there's a, there's a couple of questions here. Key priorities, deliverables, and where do you probably spend the majority of your time? I know certainly, uh, and this is, this is a good one. I, I, I really want to sort of delve into it because I know a lot of the firms um, often, and we, not just firms, I suppose, but people in general often use time as an excuse to, focus in the area that you should be focusing on so really keen to hear what your thoughts are there okay uh priorities deliverables um look my focus is mostly on on my immediate team so slt um yeah. like if that team's working then you know theory states the rest of the team should be working and, yeah. and getting the information they need i see myself as a as a removal of blockers First and foremost, particularly as we unwind. So two years ago, I was doing payroll, bookings, logistics, travel, marketing, uh, yeah, anything and everything, basically, um, when we had 50 folks. And so part of that has been unwinding, like the uh, hit by a bus, potential downside of myself and my co-founder, Dane. Um, and then part of that is we brought on some, some great senior folks. And so I'm empowering them to do great things with their team. Um, other than that, a uh, huge focus on, on team generally. Like I think culture wins at the end of the day. Um, and so what can we do to make their lives better or, or you know, stepping in to help solve an issue if we've got one? Um, I'm still involved in recruiting for like, mm, I would say 80% of our hires. Okay. Um, uh, and it's, I don't know, I, I feel like there's some level of consistency. I think people like to speak to the person running the show, but also from my standpoint, I want to make sure that we protect the culture that we've built. And the last bit for me is probably the innovation, the strategic elements. Um, so my job is to try and see around corners or look forward, um, think about where we need to go and then uh, bring that forward and, and what are we doing now? And then there's a whole bunch of other, let's call it admin stuff, which is incredibly yeah. important yes. as, as a former accountant. So stakeholder management, shareholder reporting, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's like a part of what drives the organization forward necessarily, although we've got some great um, shareholders and stakeholders in the mix who are super helpful uh, on particular subjects. Yeah, good. Do you mind um, unpacking a little bit of the term you use there, unblockers? 
Yeah, let's, let's take an example. So, um, like if we're thinking about partnerships and thinking about the future as an example, uh, a reason to do or not to do a partnership might be sizing. Um, so, like how big could this joint thing be over time? And usually, uh, like industry knowledge I still have and I tend to know because I was in cloud in early stage, it's not because I'm important. I just met all the other people that were in cloud at an early stage and they might now have large companies. And so I can make direct phone calls and sort of unblock on that standpoint, okay. help them size it and explain the user journey or what I think the pluses and the negatives are more just from experience as opposed to being an expert. I didn't work at McKinsey, et cetera. I'm not, not the world best, world's best at that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm blocking the pipeline in terms of making decisions so they can go a bit faster with, with more knowledge. Um, and really just giving more leeway to, to team managers. So, you know, uh, whether it's rolling out a new expense system, suggesting the limit should be higher as much as the accountant in me is like, that's maybe not such a great idea. Um, the reality is, is that if we spend, you know, have to hire another person to manage that system, it's sort of like, well, what are we optimizing for speed or accuracy or do we not trust our team? Um, so those sorts of things for the most part, really. Um, yeah, historically, like as we unwound my role, it was literally process software systems, uh, helping people make calls faster. So rather than thinking that they had to build a huge business case for certain things, just kind of coming through and helping them and then saying, we're going to push this through and this is why. Um, yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And, and from a team point of view, you, you know, you spoke about just then the importance of culture. Um, are you able to share? Because I think that's sometimes people have trouble with working through that. And I think over the last, well, it's going to be interesting now, most workforces are coming back to the office, but then team members also want that flexibility of working from home or continuing to work from home because there's a transport or whatever it may be. It's time consuming. How, how do you, or what do you focus on in terms of continuing to make sure that culture is at the standard you want it to be at? Um, I think one of the biggest things for us is making sure that we hire curious people and people who believe in the team concept over individual achievement doesn't mean they can't be ambitious and don't want to achieve great things for themselves. Mm. But, you know, um, have you ever seen that James Corden show where they're like, he asked the questions in, in the row and he's like, you know, would you want a 750 for yourself or take 1500 and spread it across the row to get the question right at the very end of the row? Um, like we want the people who take the 1500 as an example. So making sure that that holds true um, and making sure that we've got alignment for the future and in terms of offices, um, we've always been a fairly output and outcomes driven company. Um, so we did a, uh, what was it called? We had a name for it internally and the name escapes me, but effectively like, do you want to do fully remote, like half time in the office, I think we call it flex, okay. or do you want to do, um, full time in the office? And we did that globally for all the teams, uh, at the beginning of this, beginning of this year. Um, we rolled out an app internally called Robin, which allows us to book desks in all the offices around the world. Okay. Um, and off the back of that, we can see utilization, you know, intent versus what they said in the survey versus actualities, and then try and make sure that holds. Um, and the big thing for us is to make sure that people are once again output focused. So if you're in inside sales and you're doing demonstrations of ignition all day, whether or not you're in the office, like if you have 20 minutes to take a quick lunch break, um, and then you've got to follow up and make sure the people you've spoken to are happy. Any, any questions, any exception handling you need to do. Like whether or not they're in the office probably doesn't make a difference. Yes. And so what we focus more on is collaboration days. So the days where you don't do any work and you come in and you talk about the future of your division, your region, um, and those sorts of things. And so we're trying to run those once a month. And that's probably the, the best thing to come out of it because it means that there's actually a day where the whole team for a division focuses on how do we step change this and, and working together and sort of pulls down and some of the, the things coming out of that are great. And so all these things are kind of just adapting to the new normal. Yes. Um, you know, allowing people to work from other offices. They just want to go overseas and you know, want to extend a holiday or then you know, just like I said, get stuck somewhere for whatever reason due to COVID um, and just really trying to listen. Um, so we're pushing out a big, uh, we've never I'd say inherently we have, but that's not a really great way uh, to run a company. So we're rolling out D, I, and B shortly, um, which means many different things to many different humans. Uh, but I think that what the team wants to see and the culture gets maintained because it's always a progression. So like we've always got something else coming 
that we've listened to surveys that we've asked every six months and that we're trying to roll forward. Um, and that doesn't always have to be monetary. It can just be different ways of acknowledging things. Um, you know, like we're an Australian headquartered company. And so some of the language that we use may be offensive to others. So like listening to that and you know, educating that through the company um, uh, as an example. So I think once again, listening and then acting, I think that's the, the best way to keep it. And, and honestly, like we live our values. So um, yeah, the work without ego, um, there's probably nothing that I wouldn't do for one of my team members unless I literally do not know how to do it. So if someone asked me to write a piece of code, I'd be like, I would love to. Um, which course do I go sign up for? Um, and I'll come back in six months and give you a hand, maybe, right? Like I'm not, but aside from that, very much team effort and outcomes above sort of individual and, and making sure that people are there for it. So we keep that um, much easier to have everyone heading in the same direction rather than sort of divergence. And I think keeping that aligned is consistent messaging, branding, um, being aligned on messaging, vision, uh, mission values, but also just following up on what people ask for, whether yes. even, even if it's saying no, but just like yeah. giving them that respect. Yes, yes. And how, how often would you um, meet with the team? Uh, you know, you mentioned before, there's quite a lot of them, or is it team leaders as such to continually uh, have them or make them aware that the, you're constantly looking at forward and giving them direction, I suppose, giving them the purpose that you are, on your mission to where you want to head to? So we have weekly one, I have weekly one-to-ones with everyone that reports yeah. to me. I think there's three that are fortnightly, more like they can be weekly if we want them to. It was just more like we're not, I think we interact generally throughout the week. We're also in the same time zone in those instances. So there's not yeah. a lot of, not as much pressure um, on that to work or, or to make a point of it. Um, and then we have SLT once a week. Um, so that's a whole group where it's, you know, a mix of being able to suggest ideas, bring drafts, uh, yeah. bubble up feedback from teams and it'd be a safe space. And once again, that's sort of my number one team, right? So if they're confident being able to bring things up, you know, people can side by them, we can go off and work and have action items and, and cover those off. Um, and then as a company as a whole, we run two things um, each month. One is called a monthly business review, which is very much numbers focused. Um, we had it open for everybody we closed it off uh two months ago and we're starting to open it back up okay. uh, reason reason why we closed it off was we were finding that like there was wasn't much interaction and so the hard part for us is how to try and encourage the interaction where they might be intimidated by you know one of the team leads or and i don't mean intimidated like you know carrying a hammer but like do they feel nervous about asking a question Yes. Um, and so trying to introduce it a bit more slowly this time rather than just being on. And I don't want people to feel forced um, to come to that. Whereas all hands is kind of what happened last month at a high level from a financial standpoint and more about what's coming up and things to celebrate, et cetera. And so that's where we kind of expect everybody to attend. It's where uh, quarterly awards are handed out. And so we tend to find this a much better uh, attendance there and clearly i did not get a good sleep last night <laughs> so you're right <laughs> hey i'm good i'm good <laughs> yeah, look, uh, Luke, the, yeah go for it and uh, look the key things that you know i've just written down as well that uh, and again hopefully uh, this is all about learning and education so to everyone that's that's joined us today it's great and team you've you mentioned that more than once and it's not about playing as individuals you don't mind people learning as individuals but playing as a team to win is really important and we even spoke about that off the air before we, we and you, you mentioned a good one working without ego which is that's pretty difficult to do sometimes as the as the owner or the share major shareholder whatever it may be but that's that's a good one to be able to be aware of how to shelf that sometimes isn't it i think it probably comes so like i had a very a great couple of um, mentors who are my employers or my, my bosses my my sort of partners that i reported to through a few lines of people um coming into the profession and I took it away from one, one man in particular, you know, he was the first partner I'd sat next to in an open plan office. And this is early two thousands. Um, did not wear a tie. He wore a bow tie to business uh, to board meetings, ironically, but I think it was more, more from a, like everyone knows Peter by the bow tie guy, even if they don't know Peter by his first name. Right. So like he's memorable. Um, and just the like actions speak louder than words. Yes. So 
um, there was never any notion of talking down. There might've been a notion of you need to pick your socks up, so do better. Um, and encouraging and kind of, you know, <laughs> he would ultimately end up dropping us in the deep end and sort of like saying, I've got the life vest if you need it, but let's see if you can swim, yeah. if you know what I mean. So that was more his style, which ironically ended up working quite well for me. Um, uh, internally, um, you know, like, like I said, I think the, the culture of um, no one saying I'm too important to go deep diving or try and solve a problem, I think is, is the most important thing. Um, but they also need to be smart enough to say, I, I don't have the skills yes. you know, to go do that. And is there anyone that can help me? And so we've got a fairly, yeah. people lean in at Ignition. It's awesome. Like as I've stepped or been pushed, depending on how you view it, like as the company gets bigger, I can't be as involved in all the projects. Like when we were smaller, there was like three projects going on at any one time. Now there might be 20, which yeah. is awesome, but it's really hard to stay on top of all of them. And so um, I get pulled in on, on certain ones and not on others. Um, and it's great that the team are comfortable and like, I think you might actually need to attend this session and they give me like the too long, don't read or the TLDR of why. And I'm like, cool, yeah, I'm down for that and, and try and be helpful. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you guys use um, for, to, to manage your projects that you just spoke about? Do you use any particular software or is it an internal um, it's the silo for okay. 90% of the business. The exception would be um, Jira, which we use for uh, technical support escalation, and it's where the engineers manage their roadmap. Right. Um, very much a different use case. A Jira is infinitely customizable, which engineers can then change their workflows like month over month, quarter over quarter, if they think of a better way of doing something. Yep. Um, and Asana is a little bit more structured, even though it's fairly free-flowing. And all yeah. the Jira stuff integrates to all the dev tools they use. Right. Um, whereas Asana is more generalist. Yes. Um, and the two can actually integrate. It's just that's a bit of a double touch. So there's no point. So we use that and we started using something for meetings internally called Fellow. Oh, okay. And it grew within our organization, organization like a wildfire. Wow. Um, so if you use Teams or Slack, you use Zoom and you use a CRM that's probably one of the common ones so they don't have all the integrations. It yeah. basically makes meeting notes and follow-up actions and you can link it to your task manager individually. So we use it a lot for one-to-ones and, and leadership team meetings or group team meetings so that you can build actions and automation. So to go and create next week's agenda based with a color, with a follow-on bits, remind you about it, um, link to the action items. Like it just kind of almost acts like a, Never had an EA. I don't think I really want one, but it kind of feels like sometimes it acts like an EA to get you prepared of what's coming up. Okay. Well, and that's fellow. Fellow. I think it's fellow. Okay. Brilliant. Man, I'll look into that as well. So, mate, tell, tell, tell me about the, as we get more into this in terms of strategy, who sets the strategy? Um, are you a part of that? Um, and how do you go about then executing? Because one of the things you spoke about just then is actions, you know, and, and you're right. Um, certainly in, sort of whether it's life or in, in working business to grow a successful company, it's all about making sure that you're executing. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so strategy is set by myself. The, like the whole company ends up getting uh, a hand in, in the strategy. Right. Um, in the early days, we used to make it strategy by almost like consensus amongst the team, um, which is probably fine, sub 10, 15 people. Um, uh, but when we hit above that, we just found that like just opinions going every which way and, and, and we ended up, I think we looked at doing a, a change of something that might have been price or something. And it was like three months of discussions on Slack to get to nowhere. And it was like, okay, this is by going bottoms up. So from the team up to us and decided that, that was not the great way uh, to move forward. So now it's um, Dana, myself, so my co-founder. Um, then we'll engage with the SLT and maybe a few other um, key individuals who play um, kind of supporting roles. So, for instance, our head of data is not on the senior leadership team, but is sort of like slightly one click removed. Um, and so we'd engage with himself, um, with, with some other people on the team. Um, yeah, maybe a product marketing lead, uh, Kasha. She's amazing. So like we bring in a few other people to be like, okay, what else do we need? You know, partnerships team on the SLT, so we might engage with someone from there. <laughs> and so we're trying to tend to build it out, but usually what's happening is it's then Dane and I, uh, so once again, SLT and leadership look at problems that we think we should solve, 
in a given time frame, Dan and I will give kind of like, uh, in this case, we're working through a, um, like a lean canvas kind of approach where it's, these are the things we think we want to achieve. Yes. Um, how we get them to market, how much do they cost, uh, what we're not doing and why, uh, risks, rewards, team required, and sort of overall vision. And so we'll present that to them uh, probably at the same time after we've been through another feedback loop with those key folks. We'll then share it with the team. Um, and so then it's more of a top-down, bottoms-up. So yeah. this is what we're thinking and why. And once, sorry, strategy, this is more like multi-year as opposed to like what is the strategy for something small. Right. So something small is probably just bubbles, uh, team lead probably comes up with it, goes up one layer, layer chatted SLT, go back, done. Um, but for something bigger, it's this process. So team will, will see it. They'll have a chance to ask questions, um, call BS if they think something just flat out won't work. Um, yeah, ask questions if they think we've missed something. Um, we'll then go back on the Q&A with them. And so we're doing that halfway through this year. Okay. And then and then at the same time, we'll start to engage our board. And so our latest shareholder has a fairly active role. Um, he led our last round, JMI, and mine. they've got a great team of experts, analysts, everything that they have on, on staff that have... Um, operated, built and sold three companies back to back and joined JMI for whatever their expertise was. And so we will then pitch it over, throw it over the fence to them as we're sort of still refining it and look for the board to start calling BS. And then ideally we'll get to a board meeting uh, at the end where it's signed off on. Okay. And for us, then it's, you know, replay back to the company. Um, yeah, and sort of like we lock in all the things around it that we're sort of looking to measure ourselves by. But it's not, for me, it would be pillars. So like, what are we looking to achieve? Um, what are the key hires we need to make? What are the assumptions around those pillars? Because um, not every idea works. Um, when will we know if they're working? Uh, and, uh, yeah, doesn't move. Cost saving, efficiency, revenue, um, you know, is it a defensive play where it perhaps rules out the competition, like those sorts of things. So um, it's a fairly involved process. It tends to drag out, um, mostly due to time zones and people being busy, um, but it tends to roll out like that for sort of three year. And then yearly is sort of a smaller condensed version of the same thing. And it's like review against the three year. Yeah, you know, uh, what team, what's our cash envelope? So we're a company that invests more than we make um, at present, okay. uh, hence the capital raises. And so it's, uh, you know, within the cash envelope, what we were looking to spend after growing revenue, what's the, the best we can get done? Or is there a bet for the following year that we need to make this year where we would look to extend or accelerate the, the expenditure? Okay. Um, I don't know if that all makes sense, but it's a... Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. So, so it's a... Um, look, the... The, the key things around that, you, which which I like, is coming back down to team and making sure. So, how many how many direct reports would you have? I have a lot. I have like twelve. Yeah. Okay. And that's okay. not not meant to. I don't know. I feel like I've ended up there as we've scaled up because it was a smaller team and now it's a bigger team. Yeah. We haven't kind of put the like we don't have the CRO position. Like a, we don't have a CRO position, and so you can manage any manage imagine anything that's in there kind of that it's leading something is bubbling up to me at the moment yes okay okay and um when you're looking when you're going through that because you still mentioned that the you know you're getting involved in a lot of that recruitment stage to what are some of the the, the critical traits you're looking for people I, I know you mentioned culture was so important but uh, what, what are the critical traits that you look for and and why um quick responses to questions and okay. um, the ability to answer both in a work and or personal context without flinching and not being weird about it. And it's nothing that I like, I'm trying to dive into their personal life, mm. but I want, I want like first answers because I know they're truthful. Like, you know, someone doesn't flinch before they answer something, like, unless they're like, you know, who's your favorite musician you say Taylor Swift. You're like, actually, no, that's my child's favorite musician. It's just <laughs> the first thing that came to mind, which has happened in an interview before. Um, like that's different. It's yeah. like different mindset. Um, but very much around, uh, are they curious? So we flip my interview questions are fairly short, sharp, um, fairly sort of, uh, what I would say culture based for ignition. Um, and what it's trying to prove is that we're kind of curious about you and what drives you and where do you want to be? And, you know, 
I think one of the questions is like, where would you retire to if you could retire anywhere in the world and why? And all those sorts of things. And so it's very much, usually it's questions they can't prep for. Yes. Because uh, they haven't heard them before, no. uh, which is great. And the second part is, do they turn around and ask me questions? Because not, not that I'm a, um, I don't hold myself in high regard in that respect. It's more given you're signing up to this company, like you can ask the person who was there on day dot about history present or future you can also ask me about myself history present or future and so if someone doesn't express or demonstrate their curiosity um then it's probably not a good fit because our team is full of an amazing group of unique individuals who come together quite nicely yeah. to do great things but they all even if like like if you told me that you liked drum and bass music i probably have little to no interest i have a couple of songs i like but I'd want to know why, how did that come about? Can you send me your favorite track? Who are you liking at the moment? When are the next festivals coming up? Are you going? Like that would be a normal line of questions um, yeah. for somebody who works at Ignition as opposed to cool. Um, so it's, yeah. yeah. So more, I guess, consultative. And then the, um, the yeah. last bit is different positions we have have different kind of personality types. And it doesn't mean we don't want all folks stay on a disc profile. But, uh, you know, if someone's applying for a role that has a high volume of phone calls attached to it, as an example, um, yet you chatting to them, feeling like they really just want to build a relationship with you and they want you to be their best friend, um, as opposed to being partially transactional, right? And I'm not trying to say that, that we look for that, but that would be better suited to the role. Like, yeah. we'll write, I'll raise a flag. I'm like, I don't think I really like this person, but their personality may not be aligned to the job we're asking them to do. and they may end up hating them, hating life. Um, so those, those are kind of the two big things. So culture, quick answers, being curious, and is the personality suited to the job they're applying for. Um, I like the uh, the ability to throw them different sort of things to, to trigger them that they can't prepare for because, you know, typically the, the questions are somehow, they, they're usually the same sorts of things. So going a little bit left field is good. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, it'd be what I want, want to know about if I was going to work with somebody, right? So I think there's, there's some interesting things there. We don't judge them by their answers. Like, I don't care if you like Taylor Swift or drum and bass or whatever it is. It's just, yeah. it's an interesting question to see if someone can explain, you know, something about themselves that they didn't have a chance to prepare for. Yeah, good, good, good. Now, you mentioned uh, Peter before, so, uh, you know, sort of one of your first partners and so on. So how do you continue to learn? What's your... Do you have a coach, mentors, um, several? Yeah, I, probably, I, probably, I probably almost have like a, a panel that is informal. And so um, when I started the accounting firm, there was uh, three particular gentlemen. Um, uh, I didn't know any female partners of accounting firms at the time. And so three particular gentlemen that I tended to lean on. Um, and so one was my former boss, Peter. Another was uh, my godfather who'd worked in FMCG and had built a great business and was, uh, sorry, uh, been part of a business that had been built and still led that for the APAC region. And then the last um, was a guy who uh, built a very large event hire business. And so I would literally reach out to them and be like, what do you think of this? And send them the accounting firm's website and the latest newsletter. And they would tear it apart. Yeah. Um, you know, well, how is this any different from the person down the road? Why would I, you know, why are you using the word trust? Like you have to earn trust or it should just be assumed. Like, how is that a differentiator? And they kind of just like beat me to death with commercial logic that I would probably do the same to someone else now. But, um, uh, that was great. And then at a certain point, I sort of not tapped out, but like there, when I'm asking about innovation in the, in the field and apps and industries and how do I move into this space that was when they sort of were like we have your marketing is great we have we have no further um kind of help that we can offer other than yeah you know, if you want to talk when things go bad we're around um and so now I've got so that's that's sort of 2010 back then yeah um uh one of a uh, guy uh, that I've bounced a lot of ideas off over the time is the founder of Tractor Ventures who was our first contract coder so matt allen um so that was probably prevalent during the early stages of getting things off the ground and chatting through business models and other things um uh more recently now we've got uh, a lady by the name marie um marie uh is an exec coach 
And okay. so when I talked about that number one team bit, like yeah. things I've learned about teams and building teams over the years have been, have been quite interesting. So forming, storming, norming, performing, I think it is. Okay. Um, and so in a startup, you, you tend to be constantly kind of in between storming and forming. And, you know, by the time you front reach a level plane or you're all settled in, you're like, you're hiring again. And so yeah. it just kind of yeah. goes back through a cycle. Cycle, yeah. And so Marie, uh, Marie Taylor, she's been fantastic. Um, so she helps out on the team, team structure, if I have difficult conversations to have and probably more of an ad hoc on call um, advisor. Um, I found um, her to be quite great. And I'll say some of my team members. So like I, I get a lot of learning from uh, like Roman Karoglu, who's our VP of marketing on, on go to market. Um, uh, she did it at SiteMinder, did it at GenBook, which I think is now called Booksy. Okay. Um, our head of people and culture is, is uh, I was going to say Frankie, but Francesca Deary. I, I only know her by Frankie. Um, <laughs> Fran Francesca is awesome. Um, and just sort of my understanding that not all people think the same way that I do. And so, you know, with Marie and Frankie, it's probably been a joint lesson learned for myself on how to think about the way people receive um, things because as a 25 year old like you know i haven't worked for somebody else since i was a bartender pouring a beer at four pines in, in northern beaches of sydney when i was 25 yeah you start for that in the context you think about all the things you've learned after 25 perhaps working somewhere else a lot of that would have been like leadership skills <laughs> um how to deal with different people people and culture um yeah. and so switching from being a very like i am you know 100 hours a week and that should just be normal you know, kind of mindset to thinking about a more balanced approach and something more sustainable that can grow quickly still. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an interesting journey. And so those, those folks have been really helpful. Yeah. There. And, uh, you know, we, we, the, the, we touched on this before, but the element of, let's call it failure um, or the learning ability, because I always, whether it's failure, whether it's learning, how much do you lean on those sorts of guys to guide you, whether it's, or how do you judge whether it's failed or whether it's learning? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think if you have a hypothesis at the beginning, like I'm going to try X to achieve Y for Z period of time, and obviously you can reevaluate that. But if you get through it and like I walked away with a lot of, um, like I've learned a lot in this process, but this just really isn't going to work, your lesson might be I've learned what not to do. Okay. Um, so I started five companies in three years as a, 25 to 28 year old um does that work out right it's about right and so um uh you know lots and lots of learnings uh had a few things that i would say were successful so like one of them was with my with my very good friend um nick he and i started a company um and it was basically designed to solve the problem of people looking at buying investment properties and either telling them they shouldn't because the rate of return wasn't high enough, you know, because like if you lose money on negative gearing, sure, you get a tax break, but you're actually behind the eight ball because you've lost money. Mm -hmm. um, and so comparing that to say interest at the time, and I think this was 2011, um, but then having the ability for your account to have a subscription and then share it with your mom, your dad and have commentary and have multiple scenarios and have that all in one spot. So we built that, but the, the hypothesis was very much, um, can I get this to market? Can we get this to market together? Can we do it on the smell of an oily rag? And can we generate dollar one in revenue? And then let's reevaluate. And so we did all of that. We had developers out of Brazil. We had student developers. We had Agile coach come in and teach us about Agile principles. We had all these different learnings along the way. Um, got to sort of dollar one, realized uh, interactive accounting was just still too early. It was pretty much only relevant for Australia. Um, so small market by sort of compared to the world as an opportunity. Um, and none of us were super, neither of us were super passionate about like, I guess exactly the problem that we were looking to solve, which ultimately was re probably replacing a spreadsheet in a meeting, mm. um, ultimately. Um, but we did have some success. We just emailed all the customers, told them we were wrapping up and we you know, shut that down. So I would say that was a, a great kind of internship or apprenticeship for starting a software company. And yeah, this one, Ignition's gone a whole lot better. Um, but I was probably more stubborn around the fact that it could be successful as well. And I was interested in it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it was, it was interesting. Um, the show we ran two weeks ago, I think Ali was talking about, you know, learn to say no. And yep. it's a, it's that's a huge thing. Isn't it? Isn't it? Just a, and it's a, something that sort of resonated with me because we, as people, we, we don't like saying no, but because we want to help other people. And it's a, it's an interesting one where you get to that stage where you, you are, 
yeah, you start saying no, and it's quite empowering to actually say no. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. Like being able to have a clear focus is is huge. So I think is it be a distraction. Oh, 100. I'm guilty of saying yes or wanting to explore too many things, but I think that's my inner accountant kind of creeping back in where it's like opportunity cost. How can I make a decision if I don't know all the details? I might be leaving, you yeah. know, something on the table, an opportunity on the table. Um, but yeah, the, the ability to say no or no, just not right now, um, is huge in terms of creating that focus. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, mate, what sort of leader are you? You are, you are, give us a bit, bit of an idea, a micro, macro, um, talker, listener. What, what, what works for you? I'm probably more macro. I'm, I'm someone that, once again, we hired a human to do a particular role, perform some great things, and I'm more likely to trust on day one and empower. Um, I'm probably not the greatest. I'm sure my team will back me up on handing over things that I used to manage because it used to just be like I didn't have time to think, let alone write up a um, write up an instruction manual on how to do yeah. things. Like I did it, I did it for a lot of things, particularly around the accounting and the numbers, but other things less so. Um, and so. Um, I'm probably macro. Uh, I'll only really ever get micro for there's something that is sort of out of whack. Um, but I really hate that, to be honest. Um, and then in terms of um, talking and listening, I would say by default, my personality type, like I'm probably an extroverted introvert or an introverted extrovert, one of the two. Um, so I'm probably more of a talker. Um, I My team may disagree. I, now leadership meetings and other things, I sit there and I listen a hell of a lot. And it's more about trying to learn the art of active listening. The funny thing is, is then the team will often expect me to come in and either give a green tick because ultimately like decisions bubble up or like I wear the risk of the decision being wrong and me being okay with that. Does, does that make sense? So yep. um, sometimes I, I probably lean out a little bit too much and I listen too much. And sometimes I probably talk too much. So I'm still trying to find that balance, but I'm, I'm trying to be more of a listener. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And who 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 would have pointed that out in terms of where you need to? Is that a mentor thing or a coach thing that would identify? I've done a bunch of um, personality surveys over the years, and um, did a with Marie. We did one. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was called, but effectively it was like um, you know feedback on me as a CEO, and then what the, you know, myself, and then what the team and the board think of me, and some feedback waved in. Um, and ironically, most of the feedback in that circle is guy needs to lead from the front more, right? Whereas I think for the broader team, uh, for the most part, they're like, guy probably needs to listen a bit more and, and talk a bit less. So one of the things we try to do is make sure that, you know, aside from perhaps myself and maybe my co-founder in every monthly all hands, it's not always the same presenters. And so actually bringing in people from the teams and we have a, a guest host every month that will introduce and do all the slides that are kind of, um, you know, they can kind of do the Q and A where teams have asked questions and either myself or Dana answering them at the end, you know, happy birthdays and all the rest of it. So they kind of do the top and tail and sign us out, sign us in. And then, yeah, I get involved in a few sections. So we're, we're actively trying to mix it up and try and find that balance. But I would say, yeah, it's probably too much talking from the broader team um, and uh, not enough talking from the leadership team. Ironically, it's always an interesting one to get that balance right, isn't it? Because it's uh, you're trying to please all again, but trying to get that balance is always that's, all, that, that, that's my whole job, right? Like, I think, um, I think I put in there, I view myself as the GM of the team. Like, my job is to make sure I've got the right, if you're familiar with sports, sort of be the conductor of the orchestra. Like, yeah. how can I, how can I put the right people in the right positions so that everyone moves forward in the right direction? So, yeah, whatever feedback they give, I will take and try and enact. Brilliant, brilliant. Now let's talk about what we raised earlier, uh, top 50 women in accounting yep. globally. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's been uh, fairly important to you as an individual and obviously to Ignition as a company. So tell us about why it's important to you. Yeah, I'll start by saying I'm not very good at BSing. So I had a lot of um, early managers and mentors, particularly in the accounting firms that I worked at, who were phenomenal and wouldn't necessarily raise their hand or, or you know, apply for a job that was maybe a promotion above um, and, and those sorts of things and people being passed over for promotions. Um, you know, men, what I saw would be like, I, I tick six out of the 10 boxes, I'll put my hand up. 
um, and then the people who I thought were way more eligible for the position would not um, because they hadn't ticked two of the boxes as an example. Um, and so for me, that sort of flowed throughout my career and I sort of just saw it happening again and again. Um, and you can either sit by and not say anything or you can put your hand up and kind of do something about it. So, you know, my first hire for the accounting firm was a woman by the name of Lisa Calligan. Lisa was the first partner at Interactive Accounting, aside from myself. She was the managing partner for a bunch of years before Gareth Bryant recently. So, you know, and we hired a 50-50 um, male-female ratio pretty much the whole way through, if not still today. Um, Ignition, first CFO hire was a woman named Ros Lou, who's amazing. Um, and Ros came to apply for a support position, having a background in uh, SQL and data and being an auditor at KPMG. And I'm sitting there listening to this woman apply for this job of support. And I basically told her that she should take my role. Um, you know, so like, you know, firsthand kind of like seeing this uh, uh, play out. Um, and in between those two times, um, I kind of wanted to just put a shine a light on the scenario. And so I'm pretty sure the first year I probably nominated like 80% of the candidates or the people who are, who are nominees. Um, and I might have even written like why they should, you know, like actually filled out like the next layer for them. Um, for me, it's all about setting a tone that's a safe space that's okay and that you should put your hand up to be recognized um, and really putting that up in lights. Um, and off the back of that became and began a whole lot of community stuff. And for me, the personal challenge was um, trying to figure out how to personally be associated with it whilst not, um, not taking any of the limelight away from why. Um, and so, you know, I feel like we're, we're on the way. Uh, Brooke on our team done a phenomenal job driving that forward. Uh, this year was the first year I wasn't a, uh, on the panel. Um, and so hopefully it lives on in, in longevity and next year, um, pretty sure I've got an idea working on with a friend uh, who she will be driving a whole lot more off the back of it. So um, stay tuned. Um, yeah. I, what, we're, what we're trying to do is really make sure that that's not a, no longer a thing um, yeah. and that people are comfortable with it. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, just to everyone online, if you've got any questions, please throw them into the Q&A. You don't need to have a question, but if you want to go ask guys something, you're more than welcome to. Mate, before we wrap up, I want to just quickly talk about the expansion. Obviously, that was in the news last year. I'm pretty sure you raised yeah, it was last year. <laughs> that one was um, around 50 million US for expansion. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Is it is it whereabouts are you heading, and what's the plans to 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 use that cash? Yeah, sure. Um, we probably call them in this press release, right? So we called that out. Um, our US is a much larger market than the rest of our markets. Mm -hmm it's almost our largest single customer market and it's already our largest revenue market. And so the expansion into the US is more just calling out the focus, I think, for the media and PR as opposed to anything that's really going to change tomorrow. Um, and we'll just continue to focus on building a great company and serving customers um, around the globe. Um, we've got a lot more things that we work on this year that kind of set the foundation for what's to come. Um, and so super excited about that and the journey that we're on. Um, and hopefully you will start to see as a, any of your customers, you'll start to see some of the acceleration off the back of, you know, what you see in the product and, and, and how you use it um, come to pass and be like, you know, super happy that we did raise the capital because it means that we can deliver more and more software updates. So that we, we tend, tend to churn one out every couple of weeks. Like hopefully you'll start to see the bigger ones starting to come through as well. So um just super excited about the opportunity it brings us for the future and, and being able to bring some more great people onto the team to go and execute. 100%. Was that, was it, was that a tough thing to bring in 50 million? Um, I think every raise is, is difficult. Um, yeah. I think there were some undertones of what we're seeing right now where, where the public company's market had sort of started to decline and was wobbling a bit. Yeah. Um, and so therefore being in Australia or, or doing software and payments or even servicing a particular vertical as opposed to servicing a broader market. Yeah. Um, yeah may not have been seen as such a positive. Um, it's, it's never easy to get people's heads around why other people haven't done this. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's just odd. Like some of the, some of the things you get on the nose, um, but you know, many, many meetings later, um, uh, we managed to sort of get the round done. We had a few offers on the table. Um, we took one from, so JMI led the round uh, and they're one of Clio's largest investors. Um, 
There are also investors in people like Point Click Care, which is an amazing software company, but that targets like uh, nursing home software for the United States, right? So they've done, and they were like ServiceNow's largest shareholder before they listed, which has been more of an ERP or CRM. And so what we saw was like the understanding of a vertical and the understanding of a horizontal and where they intersect um, and relevant experience and sort of a platform team to help us scale up. As I'll say, this is the largest company I've ever worked for. And so sometimes that is a, a good thing in an investor's eyes. Sometimes it's a bad thing because mm. I've never been at a company larger nor at a software company that's larger. So a whole bunch of different feedback. Um, but it was super, it was great to get it away. It was awesome to celebrate with the team. Can imagine, can imagine. That's that just, yeah, it, it just means you can do so much more and, and faster as well, which, which is all about bringing it back to the customer, isn't it? Yep, 100%. Mm. That's where our focus is. Yeah, brilliant. Love it. Mate, congratulations. Thanks for, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story. Um, and you should be very proud of what you and Dane have set out to achieve and have achieved. And obviously, there's still a lot more for you and the team to achieve, which is fantastic to hear. So thanks again. No Let me just check. We don't have any questions. So no one's got any questions. If you want to pop them in, pop them in. Otherwise, we will wrap up in probably the next 30 seconds or so. So let me just... I'll just wait if anyone's got any questions if they come in. But otherwise, mate, um, look, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to, to have you open and honest and be on this platform. And obviously to all the firms, you know, we're dealing with all accounting firms here. So it's very relevant to other business leaders as well that is looking at this and saying, yeah, look, what's one or two or 10 things that I could take away from what Guy's spoken about and apply that to my business. So that's what professional partners education is all about. So hopefully we've been able to do that for all of you and, um, I've really enjoyed your listening to your story as well, Guy. I really have. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. And goodbye, everybody, and, and be safe this year. And hopefully everyone's getting on a plane if they feel safe enough to uh, go and explore some part of the world. Spot on, spot on. So, yeah, to everyone joining us, thank you. We've just gone over the one-hour mark, but um, thanks for joining us. Keep an eye out for our next show where I've got Ever Performs Impressive Chief Executive Daniel Spitty joining me. So, Again, that'll be out soon. I think it's on June the 2nd. We've got our next announcement coming out next week for our Women in Accounting virtual lunch as well, which is scheduled for the 26th of May, that announcement. Uh, Ali's going to be making an announcement pretty soon there. So look out for that as well. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your week and signing off till I see you next time. Thanks, Guy. See you later. Bye, everybody.